That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And he told them many things in parables, saying, In a certain city, there was a judge Two men who went up to the temple God, to pray. Man. One a Pharisee. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger there of them said to his father, was there was a rich man who was close to his father, and he and he and he was a rich man. I'd like you to turn to the person next to you and tell them your worst gardening story of your life, number one, and then secondly, the most beautiful garden you've ever seen. Worst gardening story, most beautiful. Turn to each other and just share that, would you? We are into gardens, we're into soils. How is everybody doing this morning? You all right? Good, good. I love that rain, boy. We're in Mark chapter 4. We've been here for four weeks now. This is the story. Again, he, that is Jesus, began to teach beside the lake. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the lake and he sat there while the whole crowd was beside the lake on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell on good soil and brought forth grain growing up and increasing and yielding 30 and 60 and a hundredfold. And he said, let anyone with ears to hear listen. When he was alone, those who were around him along with the 12 asked him about the parables. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? then how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. So we've been saying now for several weeks that everybody here has a hardened path running somewhere through their own heart, resistant to the seed that God is wanting to plant there. And we've been inviting you and just calling on each other to tell God about your sin, tell God about your pain, tell God about your sinful response to the pain that was inflicted upon you in order to soften up and recondition that hardened path soil in your heart so you can receive the word. Jesus continues, he says, and these are the ones sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy, but they have no root and endure only for a while. And then when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. 
Yeah, everybody here in the house this morning is prone at some point to receive a word from God, but then not let it go deep, not let it be rooted. Let the word of God penetrate the soil of your heart like a, like a drip irrigation system, just slow, steady, regular. Let the word sink in and go deep down through the rocky soil, establish itself, and sustain a fruit-bearing life. That was two weeks ago. Jesus, again, he said, and others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but, number one, the cares of the world, number two, the lure of wealth, and number three, the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it yields nothing. Everybody here has thorn bushes that want to crowd out and prevent that word planted in your heart from growing and yielding a harvest. Everybody here has worries. Many of us struggle with wealth, that is the deceit that is riches. Some of us have wealth, we think we have it, but it actually has us. Others of us don't have wealth, but we'd sure like it. It actually already has us. All of us here are wanting something else, other things, All of this is crowding out and choking the seed that wants to grow in us, this seed of a singular desire for Jesus Christ, the crucified one, to know him, to love him, and to be his agent in the world, choked out by lesser things. I ask you about your garden story. Well, I have Santa Barbara daisies in my yard. Anybody here have Santa Barbara daisies in their garden? If you know what they are, they're they're low-lying creepers. They have this rich green color, little white flowers. You'd recognize them if you saw them. They're not thorns. They're really beautiful. But they are also very aggressive. They're invasive. And in time, they smother other plants. They are never to be the main feature in a landscape. They're rather to be in a supporting role, framing, supporting, setting off the main feature in the garden. So I have to cut back these daisies on a regular basis just to contain them. Some of them I need to tear out on occasion. That is, if I want a balanced, varied, beautiful garden as opposed to some overrun, chaotic patch. Thorns, Santa Barbara daisies, I don't know what you have in the soil of your heart, but what I do know is that you need to get whatever it is under control. Jesus wraps up his explanation of the parable now. He says this, and and these are the ones sown on the good soil. They hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. 30 and 60 and a hundredfold. So the first soil, this hardened path soil, didn't receive the seed at all. The second rocky soil did receive it, but it couldn't sustain it, couldn't hold on to it, let it go, it died. Third soil received the seed, but only with one hand because the other hand was busy just fighting off thorns that were trying to choke it, had to let go, let the seed die. The fourth soil, the fourth kind of heart, received the seed, received this word with both hands, just embraced it. Did you notice, as you were listening and reading, that Jesus doesn't really tell us much about what makes the good soil good? That's not really part of what's discussed at the end. All that is discussed is what comes from this good soil. A bumper crop, this huge harvest, lots and lots of fruit, more than you would ever imagine. No word about what makes the good soil good. But I suppose in that relative silence about the good soil, there is a message to be received, as one observer put it, being a fruitful Christian is not complicated. Doesn't need a lot of explanation. Fruitfulness is not a matter of many spiritual steps or difficult disciplines or of some particular techniques that you've got to get down. It's simply a matter of receiving, of of accepting something that's given to you. 
And that is the one thing that Jesus does tell us. The good soil, that is the spiritually fertile ground, the spiritually fertile heart, simply receives the seed. It accepts it. It welcomes the word. makes a home for it. And all the rest is, in a sense, the work of a generous and sovereign God who, who is the sower. Which reminds us of the parable a bit later in the chapter, which we covered three weeks ago when we got into this great parable that Jesus teaches on the soils. This is what that other parable says. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. It just does. And again, it, that is the kingdom of God, is like a mustard seed, Jesus says, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Incredible. Just from this little tiny seed. You know, that's the story of Glenn Kirk. I mean, you all begin in the 1950s with a little tiny seed, just a handful of these charter members. And look what you've grown up into over the decades, all that God's done in you and through you. Have faith. Receive and make a home for the word. Don't worry about the future. Focus on the power of the seed and of the sower. Back to the sower in just a moment. Jesus actually does, rather he has been telling us for the last three weeks what makes the good soil good. Simply put, absent from the good soil are what make the other three bad soils bad. This hardness, like of a beaten path, this shallowness, like in rocky soil, and this crowding thorn patch. I mean, it's the absence of all of that that makes the good soil good. So that the word is not resisted, the word is accepted, goes deep with roots, it's fed, it's protected, faces no in-house competition with these crowding thorns, choking it. It's free to flourish and to bear fruit. And if you want more on what makes the good soil good, well, just, you've got to listen to the last three messages from the last three weeks. They're online, if you missed any of them. You know, it's surprising how huge this harvest from the good soil really is. 30 times, 60 times, 100 times the investment of the initial single seed. And here's something else. There are varying levels of this huge harvest. Jesus said some bear 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. Unbelievable. There is no comparison between them, no evaluation of which is better. Each one is celebrated. The plant that yields 30 times the initial seed deposited, the plant that yields 60 times, and the one that yields 100 times, it's all good. Differing plants yielding differing amounts just like people. It's not about how spiritually fruitful you are compared to your neighbor. It's just about being spiritually fruitful. That's it. Let God grow the fruit in you that he wants to grow. He's happy with that amount, so you be happy with that amount. Tend to the soil in your own heart and be happy with what grows there. Okay, back to God, the sower. Here he is. This is from Vincent van Gogh, the Dutch painter, 140 years ago. And here's another treatment of the same subject by van Gogh. The sower, sowing the seed, casting the word out into the fields.
Gary Demarest. You recognize that name? Gary Demarest, who, like me, was the transitional pastor here, interim head of staff, back in 2000 to 2002, after Walter Ray retired, speaking of a fruitful life, he, that is Gary, also served in that exact same capacity at my home church, Trinity Santa Ana, right before he came to Glenkirk to do the same thing for you. But even before that, Gary was traveling teaching for the Presbyterian Church at large, traveling around the country. He found himself in North Dakota one weekend in his itineration, and he was teaching this very parable of the sower and the soils. He was in front of a big men's group, men's breakfast, filled with ranchers and farmers out in the plains. And so Gary's thinking, as he tells the story, they're going to love this one right down their alley, agricultural images and themes, get some good discussion going. So he reads the parable after the formalities, the introductions. Sower goes out to sow. Some seed falls on the path, gets eaten up. Some falls on rocky ground. That doesn't last. Some falls in a patch of thorns, gets choked. That doesn't turn out so well. Some falls on the good soil, bears a lot of fruit. Then he gives Jesus' explanation. And then Gary opens it up for comments, for questions. Dead silence. Men's breakfast. And then comes this from this seasoned, weathered voice in the back of the room. You'd have to be a damn fool to sow seed like that. (laughs) Yeah, that's God all right, damn fool. A little awkward. Don't ask people what they think unless you really want to know. So Gary's kind of stunned. He's not really prepared for this, doesn't know what to say. He recovers. They kind of get it back on track, and they have a discussion. But, but he does see something now that he really hadn't seen before. The seed, like any seed, in this case, the seed that is the word, is precious, it is costly, you do not waste it. And this sower in the story is so generous with it, just liberally casting it about, almost reckless, seemingly wasteful, spreading it on whatever soil is within reach, whatever soil will take it, regardless of the quality, not withholding this life-giving word, throwing it anywhere and everywhere with the sole purpose, the sole hope, of it being received and growing up and bearing fruit like a damn fool. All praise and glory be to God. This reminds me of Paul's instruction to his protege, Timothy, to pray for those in government, those in positions of authority. He says this in his letter to Timothy, first letter, this is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself as a ransom for all, speaking of generously giving something that is precious and costly. This is our God, who loved the world so much that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That's John 3, 16 and 17. This is our God. This is our giving, generous God. If you're interested in having good soil in your heart, this is the God that you need to get to know. You may have a lot of other ideas about God, and that's maybe part of what the hardened path or the the weedy thorns or the rocky soil is about in your heart, what you think about God. 
God's not available. God is not trustworthy. God is stingy. Let me offer, just as we wrap this up, a word from David Siemens. He says this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Did you hear that? The most defining fact about any person is not what they at any given time may say or do, but rather what they in their deep heart conceive God to be like. It's your picture of God. Not just what you think up here, right answer, but what you really believe in your heart about him that determines everything else about you. It determines your life. Yes, God can be trusted. We say we believe that, and he can. God is incredibly generous. He's casting out precious seed right now in this house. And seeing God like that in your deep heart makes for good soil in your deep heart. Fertile ground that bears a lot of fruit. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. As the band comes back out, let me pray for you. Let's pray together. Father, help us to see you for who you really are. To open ourselves up to you as this generous, giving, loving, dependable, always there, reliable, filled with love. Father in heaven who is revealed perfectly in the face of Jesus the Son and given to us in deposit with the Holy Spirit who dwells within each believer. Father, give us a picture of you like that and may that picture be the reconditioning agent to break up the hard ground, the rocky ground, to pull the thorns and the weeds out of the patch of soil in our hearts so we can bear a lot of fruit. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, crucified, risen, and coming again. Amen.